Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Checkfront, the booking platform trusted by over 5,000 tour and activity operators around the world. You can start your own free 21-day trial over at Checkfront.com. Welcome to the Tourpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow tourpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello and welcome to episode 77 of the Tourpreneur Podcast, where we flatten the learning curve for tour operators around the world Virtual tours, should you create one or not? Today's guest is tourpreneur Jessica Hammer of Taste of Toulouse Food Tours, tasteoftoulouse.com. She also wondered whether she should be creating virtual tours. So she asked herself seven questions, reflected on her answers, and decided that no, she wasn't going to use her resources on building a virtual tour. On today's episode, she talks us through those questions, she gives us some of those answers, and shares her thinking on why she decided it's not right for her. And I would say to you listening right now, if you feel the FOMO or that you're feeling the urge to follow others and create a virtual tour, is to also ask yourself the same seven questions and really reflect on those answers and decide for yourself whether a virtual tour is a good use of your time and resources. I know some of you are enjoying success with virtual tours, and I've had your emails, and I enjoy reading your emails. And I would say this, I would love to invite you on the show so you can share with us how you've set your virtual tours up. What were the key components? What were the costs? How did you market it? What's the reaction been? And because we're an independent podcast, Tourpreneur is always happy to host different opinions on these issues. So that's enough from me. Let's cross over to Toulouse in France and Jessica Hammer. <laughs> Welcome to Tourpreneur, Jessica. How are you? Hi, Shane. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good considering everything that's going on. I'm intrigued to talk to you because right now you, you wrote to me because we're seeing this major rush online of tour operators creating virtual tours and, and you sent me an email that uh, was kind of bucking the trend from what I was seeing out there and I was really intrigued with it because you have some frustration about this rush to develop virtual tours don't you? I do yeah I feel like there's so much online everything is online these days including all of this talk of about tour operators jumping on the bandwagon to do virtual tours and experiences, which can be really good, but I don't feel like there's been enough talk about the components that make them successful and why it may or may not be a good idea for particular businesses. It's just mostly been like, everybody should do virtual tours. That's what it kind of sounds like to me anyways. I needed to get off my chest like a different perspective on it because I'm I'm personally feeling like there's a lot of pressure seeing everybody else doing this and seeing all of these webinars talking about like, oh, you should do virtual tours and how to do virtual tours without really talking about why we should be doing them or what would make them successful for you or maybe even why not. I agree with you. This is the new buzzword is the new thing to do is to have a virtual tour. And I think from how I see it, the challenge is you've got people like Walks and the tour guy who have quite a lot of resource in terms of technical resource, marketing resource, and they can create a good virtual tour. But then for a lot of us, it's like, oh, well, they're doing it. We have to do it. 
people are making money out of it, or there is the perception that people are making money out of it, and that it's, well, this is what I need to be doing. So I really love that you actually went through a process, which I think all of us entrepreneurs can learn a lot from. We should adopt this ourselves, not just with regards to virtual tours, but with any business challenge that we may have. You sat down and wrote seven questions to yourself about whether you should create a virtual tour, correct? Yeah, yeah, I did. Over the course of a few days of my daily one hour outside where I'm allowed to walk around, I walked through some of these questions for myself and came to some conclusions about whether I should be doing virtual tours. Great. So I'd love to dig into some of those seven questions. And with your permission, we could add them to the uh, the show notes as well for people to refer to. Yeah, absolutely. The number one question out there with virtual tours is, what are you hoping to get out of this? Do I want or need to make money? Is it just for marketing? Is it to give your team or yourself something to do? Any kind of successful expansion of what you're already doing you need to have some measurable goals to know if it's successful. For me, I'm a sole operator. I am the only person in my company. I've been around for a year and a half. I don't have a team to keep busy. It's just me. I'm the only person working on the business. Time for me is really at a premium. That makes it even more important for me that I have really clear goals and knowing whether doing a virtual tour is going to help me achieve those goals. Absolutely. I think that's, I'm glad you have that as number one. Yeah, I I don't feel like a lot of people are as clear about that as they need to be upfront. I think that there are some really good examples of people doing the virtual tours these days with their main goal of being marketing, which is great and can be very successful, but you need to make sure that you have a, a good marketing and promotional plan to back that up. Because if you just put them out there and you're hoping to have it be a marketing effort, and you're not sending out press releases or following up on leads with reporters on help a reporter out or doing social media behind it, then it's going to flop. A lot of the rest of my questions were more about the selling side of doing the virtual tours. If a lot of people, well, most tour operators now are not making any money. (laughs) I'm certainly not making any money. We've been closed down here in France on confined to our homes since March 17th. And we've been told that things will start to slowly reopen on May 11th, but bars and restaurants will still be closed until some point in the future. They haven't said when. I'm not able to run my tours until bars and restaurants can open back up because that's kind of the point where my businesses will be hopefully comfortable letting me eat in those businesses. I want to get back to your questions. But before we do that, actually, I think this was one of your questions is, is there something else you can sell besides a virtual tour experience? And you know, our mutual friend, Carolyn Connor at Lyon Wine Tastings is doing an online wine tasting session, isn't she? Yeah, that is one of my questions coming up in a little bit. Okay, let's go back to question number two, then. A lot of the rest of these questions come under the heading of, okay, if your goal is to make money, My next question is, okay, is your audience large enough that you can sell your tours or experiences just to them and sell enough of them to make it worth the investment of the time and the money? Because a lot of the companies that I see doing the virtual tours right now successfully are frankly larger companies who have a really established customer base and a mailing list to be able to sell to those customers. They're not spending money on marketing those virtual tours right now. They're basically selling to their established customers already. Do you have that customer base? I probably don't as much. You know, I've only been in business for a year and a half, and I do have a lot of people that are behind me and support me and love what I do, but probably not enough to make it worth the investment of how much time and money I'd have to put into it. Yeah, I think that's a really important question to ask yourself because I enjoyed a virtual tour on the weekend. And that was with walks. And I didn't realize when I booked it, it was 10 bucks. There was a $25 credit and for a in-person tour. So it struck me that they probably were... Using it as a marketing opportunity. Yeah. And also marked into their past guests who, because, you know, walks have a bit of a brand. I think they're operational in 12 or 13 cities. So if you've enjoyed their tour of Rome, you'll enjoy their tour of Dublin or London, wherever it may be. They do, like you were talking about, the large enough audience, but also past guests. So they probably 
and Stephen Otto listens to the show, the owner, if I'm wrong, correct me on this. But if I got an email from Walk saying, hey, we've got these virtual tours by doing this, you can help support a tour guide or help the business. And here's a $25 credit for a future in-person tour. There's a chance that I might jump on it. And on the virtual tour, I, I went on with them to Pompeii. There were 32 participants, which I was really shocked at. So yes, they, they do have good marketing, but I do wonder how much of that 32 is actually past guests who just want to show support for the, for the company. Yeah, they're one of the examples of somebody who's doing all of the right things and they made that decision for their business that it was going to be a good way for them to make money and also a good marketing opportunity for them. I'm not saying that nobody should be doing virtual tours. I'm saying that you have to answer these questions for yourself and evaluate whether it's a good opportunity for your business. Oh, and I love these questions. I think you're absolutely right to do this. But I think it's like you're saying, those with lots of past guests, that channel could be successful. But if you don't have a lot of past guests and you're new like you are, you know, 18 months, two years into business, it's going to be very tough to market. Yeah. And speaking of being tough to market, my next question is, will you be trying to sell something that others are offering for free? Because along with the proliferation of paid online experiences, you have an equally large, probably even bigger amount of free online activities that are happening right now. If that's the case, do you have a plan for how you're going to differentiate your products from all of the free products? And what Wax is doing is a great example of how you do that with your paid virtual experience, offering a voucher for a future tour, things like that. You know, that's a great example. You have to have thought that through. You have to have a plan for that because free is a lot more sexy right now because of all of the economic hardship that has gone along with this COVID crisis. And also, I think you raise a good point there. It's not just what else is out there for free. It's just a virtual tour is also competing with Netflix. I'm not sure what the monthly subscription is to Netflix. I probably should. It's something I should look at when I'm looking at my finances, but it just comes out of my account. I just pay it. But $10 tour versus, I don't know, a $14 subscription for a month for all that content. And then, of course, there's the, the well-known website, YouTube, that has so much free content on that you're also, that's what you're competing against, really. Because And I don't mean to pick on walks here. Maybe I'll pick a different one. Let's say there's a virtual tour of Stockholm and that's 10 bucks. But then I can go on YouTube and watch a documentary on Stockholm for free. You're also competing with all of the free streaming and events that are happening on social media platforms as well, like Facebook and Instagram. Another good example of somebody having a good plan for their business during this crisis is Devour Tours, also a food tour company. And they're doing a whole bunch of free online events through, I think it's Facebook Live, where they're featuring some of their tour guides from different cities and having a specific topic, like maybe it's a wine tasting or it's how to make ham croquetas, or I forget what some of the other ones are, but they're basically free experiences. However, which brings me to my next point, is there something else you can sell besides a virtual experience? Because while Devour Tours is doing a lot of free online experiences, what they are doing is selling a PDF cookbook um, based on recipes from their food tours. I bought a copy. What did you think of it? Really good. Love the recipes, love the photos. But typical Shane, I haven't cooked from it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another recipe book I buy and I don't cook from. I love the potatoes recipe and I actually bought the ingredients for it, but there's 20 steps. So it's like running a marathon for me, right? I'm like, okay. I'm going to have to reserve a whole day for this, <laughs> but great idea. Yeah. Well, if you can't do it during confinement, then when can you? But some of the other examples of other things that you can sell besides a virtual tour or experience, my friend Caroline, who you mentioned earlier from Leon Wine Tastings, she's doing free online virtual wine tastings during COVID. But what she's also doing is working to develop an online course on wine tasting. And I see kind of online courses as a little bit of a different type of a product than virtual tours or experiences because it's more in like the education focus than tourism. And they'll have a lot longer of a lifespan. I've also seen other food tour companies offering food tours in a box, which while it may include a virtual tour component, it's providing their customers with a physical product. It's not a possibility for me. I don't have a vehicle. And so I can't really do deliveries 
around the city, the way that some of the companies I've seen doing are. But I think it bears asking, is there something else that you can sell besides a virtual experience? One thing I'm working right now on right now is creating an e-commerce shop on my website where I can sell branded merchandise. There are companies that do what they call print on demand, where they will only print the merchandise once someone has ordered it. And so they handle all of the printing and shipping and fulfillment. So then you don't have to carry an inventory. You don't have to do all of the fulfillment yourself. You make less money off of it, but I think it's worth it for not having to do all that work. I completely agree. I have some really nice looking tote bags here, tourpreneur tote bags. There's only five in the world and they're here <laughs> <laughs> that I had made to give to some some uh, supporters of the show at Arrival Berlin, which is why they're still here because it was canceled. But I've been dabbling around with that myself. But I wanted to go back on, um, this intrigues me. So having read your bio, we're going to invite you back on the show so we can do a full deep dive on how a daughter of a blueberry farmer from Michigan ended up in Toulouse. But I also read you were a, uh, a cheese monger, right? Yes. This is maybe my like third career right now doing food tours. Prior to moving to Toulouse two and a half years ago, my husband and I lived in Chicago for 11 years. And for nine years, I worked in marketing for a small neighborhood chamber of commerce. So still working with small businesses, but specifically on marketing and special events for the neighborhood and consulting with the businesses and helping all of them do their marketing. So now I'm having to practice what I preach. But then after that, yeah, I worked as a cheesemonger in Chicago. I was behind the counter selling cheese and wine and getting people to taste all sorts of delicious things and talking to them about it. And that is where I really learned to love talking about food all day. Right. My question was, when I read that about you, and I was like, oh, wow, so Carolyn is doing the wine tasting. Is there anything you can do in terms of an online experience or education with regards to cheese tasting? I've thought about it. Um, the, the difficulty is that while you can get pretty decent wine almost anywhere, that's not necessarily the same with cheese. You can only get good cheese in France, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, but I'm saying that you have to, for example, as you said, I'm the daughter of blueberry farmers and my family are in very rural Southwest Michigan. So their nearest grocery stores are like a Walmart and Meyer, which is a grocery train in Michigan. You basically can't get artisanal cheese there. You can get some decent cheese possibly, but also it's Buying good cheese in the U.S. is like two or three times the price of what it is in France. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Even living in a dairy state like Vermont, it's not cheap. You want to buy local. Oh, I miss Vermont Creamery. Yes. Oh, my waistline doesn't. <laughs> so, no, it's just interesting you say that when I read your background. I thought, well, I wonder if that, as we're looking at things to pivot into during lockdown. And I asked it because like, I like cheese. Cheese is one of, it's my kryptonite. It's my weakness, but I don't really know cheese. I mean, I have a few favorites, right? But I don't really know my way around a cheese board or what I should pair things with. Now, there, there may well be other cheese online courses out there, right? I haven't really looked into it, but it was just an idea that popped into my head. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely like things that I've been thinking about. You could do a class on how to put together a cheese tray or cheese pairings with different things. Yeah, there are definitely stuff that has been done online before. And it's something to think about. It's just, as you're going through these questions, you're putting some some things in the pros column and some things in the cons column. And does having this like one really good idea, like tip it over into like, oh yeah, this is something I should do. Plus also you're competing uh, against Masterclass. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with masterclass.com. Yeah, I've, I have been seeing a lot of their ads on exactly. Facebook lately. <laughs> exactly, and that's the thing. So you're, I'm sure they, I mean, they have tons of courses, right? And they have, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who's an author of spy books, and he's trying to put this course together on, on how to write novels. And I said, you should get in touch with Masterclass. And he's like, yeah, they've got Stephen King working for them. Like, what chance have I got? <laughs> you know, they have marketing dollars. They obviously have good funding. So you are, even when you want to have an online, create an online course, you are competing against some big giants. And it's not to say it can't be done, but it's going to take marketing dollars or, or time, which we'll get on to uh, where the better that can be spent maybe. 
Yeah. And there's even a new platform that I'm having a call with someone later this week called Top Nosh. That is a platform for food and beverage professionals who want to do online experiences or courses, which is interesting. As I said before, I'm not absolutely anti-online experiences and tours. But they're different, right? I think that's the key point. Yeah, we just have to see. We just have to see and just keep kind of like asking yourself these questions about whether or not it makes sense for you. What can you do with your reservation software? Take online bookings and payment, manage your inventory, automate processes, and view reports and insights? Yeah, of course. But can you also send digital waivers, build a stunning website, and get help around the clock? What about optimize your booking channels, diversify your distribution, use your favorite tools, and choose your pricing model? With Checkfront, you can. One booking platform, limitless possibilities. Find out more at Checkfront.com. I'm someone who loves online education, and I absolutely would, and I have signed up for various courses. And in fact, I said this the other day on the podcast that when I looked at Airbnb experiences, they had a magic course. I said, oh, that'd be kind of fun. That'll be something non-work related, non-health related, just something fun to do. So I'm, I'm a big fan of online course, but virtual tours like you, I'm, I'm off the fence having enjoyed one on the weekend, experienced one. And I did enjoy it though. The thing is that I enjoyed it, but would I book another one? Probably not. That's the thing. Yeah, there's definitely a difference when you're talking about tourism versus education. Another company who's doing very successful online experiences is Context Travel, which is a travel and tourism company, but they're framing their experiences a little bit more through the lens of education. They call them Context Conversations, I think. They're having their experts give a talk on some specific thing. So it's more focused on education than come see, we're going to take a virtual walk through the Louvre. It's worth asking yourself what the focus of your experience would be. And is it like more towards tourism? Is it more towards education? What need does it fill? Yes. And especially if it's niche, I think that's important, specialized rather than being too broad. Yeah. Another question I had to ask myself is, will making sales right now disqualify me from government aid? This question does not apply to everyone, but I think it kind of bears asking and thinking through because here in France, independent businesses like mine are eligible for payments of up to 1500 euros per month for the months of March, April, and May. If you can demonstrate a reduction of at least like 50% of your sales volume compared to last year. And because last year I had just started my business, I was less than six months into it. You know, my sales weren't huge, especially since like those were not the high seasons. We don't get into the high season until like summer. Am I doing all of this work to try to make money that is just going to reduce the government benefit that I might be eligible for during this like very specific time? It's going to be different for everybody depending on what country you're in, but it's definitely worth looking at what aid you're available for and what are the conditions of that aid. Because I'm just thinking there was a question in our Facebook group recently about if you're getting the people, and this is the United States, if you're getting the payment protection loan, or payment, wherever it is to pay your staff, what can you have your staff doing? Because you can't lead any tours. And if they're not being paid, then you know you don't get forgiven for the loans, et cetera. So maybe for those situations, and again, I know this is very particular to the US, having them create some kind of virtual tour may be a way of putting your staff to work. But that's... Africa to the US. But yeah, I think it's always important to make sure, even when it comes to paying tour guides, right, is to make sure you're well up on how it affects their benefits and what the local laws are. Yeah. And it's going to vary. So you'll have to check with your accountant or some sort of business support organization in, in your individual country or state or whatever it is. But Talking about how you want to use your time brings me to my next question is, is your time better spent doing something else? And how much time do you have? For me, as I said, I'm a solopreneur. So my time is all I have. I don't have other people's times. I don't have a staff that I need to like make sure that they're doing something right now. I have to be really careful about my priorities and how I spend that time. And thankfully, or I guess <laughs> ironically, at the beginning of this year, I did a 
strategic planning retreat with a few other entrepreneurs that I meet with and came away from that retreat with a theme for the year, which was resilience, (laughs) which is why I say it's ironic. And also a list of projects that at the time I identified as things that would help my business become more resilient. Fast forward several months later, we get put in confinement. And thankfully, I have this list of things that I can be working on. I wasn't really scrambling around at the beginning to say like, what do I do? Like, what do I do now with all this time? It's like, okay, well, guess you can buckle down and work on some of the things that you said were really going to help your business this year. Can you give us an idea of what some of those tasks were? Yeah, some of them were things like working on my SEO, writing more content for my blog, which is something I always struggle with having the time to write blog posts. Developing my email marketing plan to include um, drip campaigns for potential customers, because right now I do email newsletters, but those don't really help people who have never come to Toulouse. Also, just to kind of general updates to my website, as we were talking about adding an e-commerce shop with branded merchandise, lots, <laughs> my, my list can keep going. I could be in confinement for four months and probably not get all of it done. I hope we're not in confinement that long, but... <laughs> I have things to do. I had to kind of think long and hard, like, is it worth it for me to completely pivot into doing a virtual tour or experience when I have all of these things that I have already identified as priorities that could really help me in the long term? Yeah, smart, especially uh, SEO. Yeah. Right now, one thing that you can do that is really helpful is use your time to take some SEO courses. If you don't understand it, I think Yoast SEO, which is an SEO plugin for WordPress, was offering for a time, they were offering their basic SEO training for free, which is a fabulous resource. And also there is, I don't know if you're familiar with Skillshare, which is an online learning platform. They offer two months for free as an introduction, which, hey, we're in confinement. This is a good time to put it to use. And so I've been taking SEO courses and content marketing courses on Skillshare When I say courses, a lot of them aren't that long. To watch the whole thing, it's maybe like an hour or two. You feel it's worth your time? I do. I've gotten some really good stuff out of them. I think you get out of it what you put into it. If you need to do more than just watch them, you need to like actually fill out the worksheets that they, that might accompany the courses and do some thinking about how it really applies to your business instead of just watching it and being like, oh, that's interesting. And then on to the next thing. Oh yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very guilty of that. So I always, yeah, that's something I'm still working on. Absolutely. But it's good to hear that about Skillshare because one of the things I do get fed up with is when you take a free course and it's a big upsell for the paid premium VIP in a circle course that those people have. And obviously Skillshare is a platform, so it doesn't have it or neither does Udemy. But a lot of things I see out there, a lot of courses are free and then it's the big pitch. And a lot of books have got that way as well, which is a shame. I found Skillshare to be very useful so far. I have a whole bunch of classes like on a list of ones that I want to take. They have stuff on video editing because that's another thing that I want to get into, which I can't really right now because we're not allowed out for very long. But after we're done with confinement, maybe I'll start doing some videos. And you haven't got a cat or anything you can video at home and then work on that instead. Shane, I am so sad right now because when we were in Chicago, we had a cat, but we had to rehome her when we moved because she was really too old to comfortably make the cross-continental voyage. And we found a really great home for her. And I'm so happy with where she is. But then, so we moved to Toulouse and we don't have a cat. And here you can foster cats, just help them stay out of the shelter for a while while they're up for adoption. And I am so mad at myself that I like didn't think to go out and get a foster cat before we went into confinement because I could really use some cat cuddles right now. But would you give it back though? See, that's, yeah, that would be hard. I have two rescue greyhounds, right, who I love, and they're always looking for fosters. And I said, like, I can't do it. I'd love to help, but I know I'll end up with eight dogs if I do that. It's true. But if you do something like foster kittens until they're old enough to get adopted out, it's a little bit easier. Okay. All the uh, dog lovers listening and pet lovers listening are agreeing. The rest of those who don't like animals are like, get on with it, guys. So (laughs) no problem. So your final question. 
Yeah. So my final question is just how do these virtual products tie into your long-term plan? And are people still going to buy your virtual products after the stay-at-home orders have been listed? Because right now, everyone's kind of a captive audience online. They can't go out and do other things. They can't travel. They can't go to restaurants. They can't go out to the movies. They can't even like go hang out in the park in a lot of places. You have to think about like, what is the life cycle of this product? Are people going to still want to be buying this once they can maybe not like travel long distances, but once they have a little bit more freedom of movement and have to get back to their quote unquote normal lives? And frankly, a lot of these things, like, I don't know if people will, I don't know if it's at least in my mind. And (laughs) just for me, I'm, once I get out of confinement, there's like all of these things I want to do and I want to stay outside. I don't want to be stuck behind my computer screen anymore. I need to spend some time away from my computer once we're out of confinement. I don't know if there's going to be as much of a market for some of the products as there is right now. So how long is that market going to last? I would agree with you. I think where they'll be useful is when someone goes on your tour and you can say, look, as a thank you, here's a virtual tour. You basically give it away for free as a little nice to have. But I just don't see people booking them. There's some things that you know, might have a little bit longer lifespan, for example, like online cooking courses or um, some of the, the more like educationally minded or like skill related classes and things like that. But just in terms of like some of the virtual tours that we're seeing right now, I don't know, a month from now, is this going to have any relevance? They're two very different things. I think that's what the important thing I'm getting from you and it's listening to you today and also what I've been thinking about is virtual tours are not online educational courses. They're very different. Yeah, I've been kind of thinking more along the lines of using the time that I have right now. I'm also working on figuring out the challenges and logistics of adapting tours to a more local audience because that's one of the things that everybody is also saying and rightly so that the local tourism is going to come back a lot more quickly than the international tourism that I rely on almost exclusively right now. I'm going to have to put a lot of thought and planning into how I adapt my tours and my offerings to appeal to that market. Like I said, I'm a sole operator. I do this myself. If my attention is divided. And I guess you have, you have a different set of challenges, right, Jessica, because you are offering an English language tour in France, whereas local people are going to want to go on a French speaking tour. Yes, kind of. Right now, about 15% of my customers are English speaking expats that live in Toulouse or in the area. Considering that, like you said, I give English speaking tours in a French speaking market, um, I think that's a pretty good proportion. But I'm going to have to do some work to tailor my tours and experiences more towards both that English speaking expat market towards the people that live here. But also I'm working with someone to develop French speaking tours because I can speak French, but I don't want to spend four hours speaking in French about French food to French people. That's a shade too far for me. Um, so I'm so that's another way that I'm spending my time right now is trying to figure out what the best way of adapting to the changes in the market that we're going to be seeing. And how, I mean, obviously business travel is it's going to be tough for that segment to recover. And I imagine with you being in Toulouse, on Airbus there? Yes, this is kind of a double whammy for, for us here in Toulouse because we're the headquarters for Airbus, which is the international airplane manufacturer. That's one of our major industries here. They are heavily affected by what's going on because if airplanes aren't flying, airlines aren't ordering. So yeah, there's been a lot of not so much layoffs yet because the situation in France is different than in the U.S. Because here in France, they have what's called partial unemployment, where if there's been sudden changes in to the marketplace, like with the coronavirus crisis, businesses can decide to put their employees on unemployment where they're getting 80% of their salary and they have to front the money, but then the government pays them back, which is a way of still keeping their employment contracts intact. It's called technical unemployment. Um, So like you're technically unemployed, but you're not actually unemployed because theoretically your contract will be resumed once things get rolling again. 
there are a lot of people here that are now on this like technical unemployment where they're not working, but they're, they still have a work contract. Yeah, and I was thinking about this earlier because a good friend of mine works for Airbus. So that's he's often in Toulouse. But of course now oh, really? cool. that's going to be, yeah, that's what made me yeah. think of it in the first place. And but then you think of all those people from around the world who would come to head office for training or meetings or whatnot, that you know would be the corporate side of you offering those tours. That's something like, when will that recover? But I guess also if we try and be positive that in this downturn, like is now the time to come up with a creative plan to go to, let's say Airbus, for instance, and say, okay, well, this is what we can offer. If you, we talked um, about this with Lauren for local food adventures over in Oakland about how she can get in front of the big dot coms in San Francisco and say, Hey, when you've got people coming for interview and they're coming to check out the city, why not put them on my tour and various packages like that for the HR departments? Because everyone's always wanting everyone to enjoy their time, either when they're visiting head office or trying to coax people to work in head office. Yeah, I was really just this winter working a lot harder to develop the B2B market here and starting to do some kind of tours and events for companies here. Because it's not just Airbus, it's all of these kind of satellite companies that um, feed into the same, that are here because Airbus is here. I was working a lot with those. And of course, all of those events are canceled now. And I talked with a few people about, you know, whether companies like that would be interested in virtual here in France, we have a tradition called apéro, which is uh, like the drinks hour between when you get off of work and when you go eat dinner, because dinner is really late here. That's kind of a time sometimes when like corporate teams will get together and they'll have a drink and some little light munchies and stuff. And so I was thinking, okay, what if we did kind of a virtual apéro where each employee was sent a box of goodies from local businesses, and then everybody got together on Zoom or whatever and did. We talked through like what those things were and kind of did a tasting of them all together. And I talked with a few people about that. And frankly, like right now, these businesses in this industry, they're not spending any money. <laughs> it, it's all in a holding pattern to see how this is going to play out because there's just so much uncertainty, obviously in so many industries, but particularly anything to do with airlines and travel. They're not spending anything that they don't have to spend right now. Yeah. And I guess I'm trying to think positive and long term that I see all these predictions online and I don't trust any of them about when things are going to get back to normal, anything near normal. But it's like, OK, at some point they are and I want to be ready with my B2B action plan that I can get in front of Airbus and say, hey, we have these packages. And I always think that the best way of doing that is what problem can you solve for that company? So as I said earlier on, it could be people that you know, are on a short list to join the company and they're trying to sell the city to them as a place to move. It could be take their team out when they've hit a goal or a target. And I know as somebody who used to you know, be in charge of you know, 100 people that it's really hard to come up with things to do every month for your social activity that everybody will enjoy. So I think my advice to you and to others listening is to think, okay, when we're in normality, what problems do they have in the corporate world that I can solve with my product? Because when I look at your website, tasteoftoulouse.com, the first thing I notice is where you say, rank number one trip advisor for food and drink experiences in Toulouse. And that just carries so much credibility in my eyes. Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm working on right now as well, refining those offerings for the B2B market and kind of putting together some some packages and things like that and definitely like thinking ahead. Well, maybe what we can do, Jessica, is have a round table on a future episode of people who've done this in the past with success. I'm all about sharing those success strategies, but I think it's something that you know we, we should focus some time on on the show. Actually, I've had a conversation with several other food tour owners who have had great success with the B2B market to try to figure out like how I can replicate that. So yeah, that's something I think is really for a lot of tour companies, like the B2B market is a really important piece of their business. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com.
Well, Jessica, thank you for coming on. I know we were run by 10 minutes, as I feared we might. <laughs> so I would definitely love oh, well. to invite you. No, these are really important subjects and topics, and you and I are aligned on this. But like I say, I was just really impressed that rather than having the fear of missing out, you know, you just sat, you know, you went for your walk and you asked yourself seven questions and then you wrote down your answers and came up with, you know, what was right for your business. Someone else might do that and say, no, virtual tours are right for me. And that's cool as well. I mean, I'm going to interview more people that are running virtual tours and to find out, you know, what they've been learning and what their successes have been, because we're all different serving different markets. So just because Jessica and I subscribe to this view, it doesn't mean it's right for everybody. And that's the beautiful thing about the tours and activities industry, right? It's just so very diverse. And like, you know, frankly, I might end up offering some sort of a virtual experience. Like that might happen if I keep looking through these questions, something looks different. One thing that's been particularly disorienting about this whole crisis is that the information that we're getting is changing so quickly for so many things. That to me is just why these questions were really helpful is because it helps me think through the different aspects. And right now I'm looking at these and saying, you know, it doesn't really make sense for me, but if more information starts coming out and certain things are different, then well, maybe it's starting to look a lot better. Absolutely. Jessica, where can people follow you online? You can visit my website at tasteoftoulouse.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook at Taste of Toulouse. It's pretty easy to find me. Marvelous. And I'll add all those links to our show notes, which you can find at tourpreneur.com 77. What's 77 in French, Jessica? Oh, dear, Shane. Numbers are the worst. That would be, um, especially when you get up into the 70s. So that would be 77. There you go. I, you know, it's funny you say that because I'm learning German and I really struggle with numbers as well. In French, you said 77. Mm. So that would be 77, which is really what that means literally is 6017. So you have to like do math at, at the it's same crazy. time. German's the same. It's like, oh, brilliant. Thank you very much for your time today. We're wishing you all the best and uh, excited to bring you back on for a future episode. I'm really curious to find out more about your business and your learning so far. Thank you, Shane. And as we say in France, uh, bon courage. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.